Good morning, everybody. It's nice to see so many people. I can see a lot of young people have joined since yesterday. So I have a double challenge, because some of you, you debated all this yesterday, and know a lot of these stuff. But just in order to get a joint platform for all of us for discussing why it really matters with energy savings, energy efficiency, I would like to start showing you a small movie. Well, it's not exactly an Oscar movie, but uh, it comes here. Uh, somebody, yeah, and you see what this is. This is uh, not fiction, it's facts. It is the uh, temperatures as they have actually been measured around planet Earth since 1880, where it gets blue and white, it gets colder, and where it's yellow, orange, red, it gets warmer. And you can see that it's a quite dull picture. Not much is happening. It's getting colder. It's getting warmer. Not much to report about. But then try and look and maybe observe where it's getting quite hot. So this is what an average global temperature increase of 0.8 degrees looks like. Uh, and this shows how over the last 39 years we have had an average global temperature that exceeded the average temperature of the 20th century. This also shows why the nine out of the 10 hottest years ever registered were in this century. And you could see that 2014 was the hottest year recorded to date. But scientists tell us that this year will probably be even warmer. I just think that this with few words, or rather with no words, tells us why we are in for some challenges. The other day we saw the pictures from Ken. You saw that there with the heavy precipitation, 16 people dead. Three still not known their, their destiny. That was in the heart of Europe. Uh, in Europe, in Denmark, when we have unpredictable weather, sudden precipitation or drought, whatever it is, then people can just buy an insurance. Uh, if you are living at the Horn of Africa, or in the Philippines, or in Nepal, or other poor countries around the planet, then climate change can mean, as an Ethiopian farmer told me, the difference between one or two meals a day. So to people living in all parts of the world, this is getting really, really serious. I'm not going to bore you with a lot of technical details on, on the climate case, but I just want to give you one example. Syria. Right uh, some months ago, uh, a new research uh, study came out from University of Columbia and University College London, where they could see a link between climate change and the civil war in Syria. How come? Well, in 2007, Syria had a very, very, very severe drought starting. It continued into eight, nine, and 10, one and a half million Syrian farmers and their families fled from the rural areas of Syria to the cities of Syria. And the cities could not absorb that because they already were busy handling refugees from the Iraqi wars and they had the problems with Assad and the authoritarian regime and so on and so forth. I'm not saying that climate change is the only reason, nobody is saying that, for the civil war in Syria, but it is what people in Pentagon call a threat multiplier. It's making other threats even more dangerous. And we all know now what happens when you have a civil war like in Syria. People start to immigrate, to flee, they become refugees, and suddenly you find them on a highway in Denmark. So just to make sort of this short introduction in order to say climate change is not just about a distant future. 
we already see the beginning of it. While at the same time we have this movie accelerating, it's also a fact that when my children will be my age, and when the school children up there will be my age, then we will be around 10 billion people on planet Earth, all wanting a share in the good life, all needing water, energy, food, mobility, cooling, heating, what have we. So whether we want it or not, we need a lot of growth. Really, we will get a lot of growth. But how to slow down the climate movie here? Well, that is about using less fossil fuels, coal, oil, and gas, using our resources and our energy more efficient, efficient and of course, also getting more out, uh, output of less input, and we also need to have much more renewables. That's sort of the short story. Is that easy? No, it's not easy. We have been building our economy and our growth and our industrialization for centuries now on having relative cheap access to oil, coal, and gas. So what we are in for is a really substantial change. So what I've been asked to say something about this morning is what politics can do to decrease energy consumption. And that is a very good place to start. Because to save energy, to make more energy efficient products, in the world I've tried to describe briefly here, that should really be a no-brainer. How do we do that? Well, in Europe we uh, have had the experience that when we put up targets, politically speaking, then it helps. Uh, we put up targets for 2020 for CO2 reduction, for how much of our energy that should be renewable, and for energy efficiency. And the interesting thing is that now, these days, we are on track to meet all the targets, maybe with a small exception on the energy efficiency side. Because it's so difficult to get the other politics in place. I'll come back to that. But basically, it helps when we put up target. Why? Because then governments, mayors, business, citizens know where, which way to go. And it has actually worked in Europe. In Europe, we have proven that we can have economic growth over the years and yet still use less energy. We have decoupled, as it's called. We have very good examples of that in many member states in Europe. But for instance, in Denmark, I was the Minister for Energy and Climate when we put a requirement to the energy companies that they should save energy. And you could say, that's a strange thing. How can you ask an energy company to save energy? I mean, that's what they do, that's what they sell, that's what they live from. But it actually made them invent quite new business areas. Because then they were forced to go out to their biggest customers, for instance, in industry, and saying, well, we have this requirement from the government that we have to save energy. Could you and I make, make a new way of saving energy? energy. We have these and that solutions, we have this and that way of financing it, and you can have a good business case if you are much more energy efficient. I think this is really a case where we have very good examples to offer in Denmark. Putting up targets help for developing politics like that. Another thing that helps is when we get the price right. I'm working quite a bit with Norway for the time being. Their electricity costs close to nothing. Well, if energy is extremely cheap and costs close to nothing, why on earth, for instance, build more energy efficient buildings? So in Norway, they have really many very inefficient and very energy consuming buildings. It helps when we get the pricing right. Through an emissions trading scheme as we have in Europe, Also through energy taxes, to put it a bit sort of in a one-liner, you could say we should tax more what we burn, less what we earn. 
to be more on the energy we consume so that people have an incentive to save energy and so that business have a good business case. Um, also, we should price much more correctly the real cost of oil, coal and gas. With the technical term, price the externalities, that is actually one of the really big reforms we need if we are going to combat climate change in a cost-efficient manner. Why invest in energy-efficient solutions if energy is extremely cheap? People are not doing that. Uh, it must pay off to invest in the better solutions compared to in the more inefficient solutions. Uh, it must pay off to build in, uh, energy efficiently instead of not building uh, in an energy and resource efficient manner. It must pay off to renovate buildings in a way that they consume less energy, maybe even produce net energy than the other way around. But there is a challenge in the way we have structured politics. And for that matter, business. And for that matter, also academia. There is a tendency very much in politics to think for the short term. But that is a paradox because many of our challenges and the climate change challenge is very much requiring long-term thinking. So this short-termism that is dominating politics is really one of our big challenges. And by the way, the other challenge is that we have organized ourselves in silos you take care of climate, you take care of energy, you take care of transport or of buildings or research or whatever it is, where many of our challenges are complex and require that we think cross-cutting. I think that some of you have been discussing this already yesterday. But the problem is also that what is the cheapest solution today is not necessarily the cheapest solution in the longer term. That is why it's so important to have the longer light on when we discuss these things. Uh, the, when we calculate what a thing costs, what an investment costs, there is a very, very strong focus on the price of this new thing. But if we incalculate it and incorporate it, when we are talking price more, the running cost, the cost after something has been sort of taken into use, then we would also have some better and more informed choices. So we need to reform the way we assess what a given investment, what a given project actually costs. Now, that is not just nice to have because of climate. Uh, some of these things we really also need for security reasons. Energy security, but you could also see, say, security in general. Not just because of the potential conflicts that are in a picture like, like the, the one I showed you with people fleeing from where they are. But in Europe, we have a very big issue with energy dependency. Europe is importing today 53% of all our coal, oil and gas. As an average, we spend 400 billion euros, 3,000 milliarder danske kroner every year paying for our imported coal, oil, and gas. 3,000 milliard kroner. One third of that, where does that go? It goes to Russia, it goes to Putin. I hope he is happy getting our money. Hope he spent them well, I'm not so sure of that. There is really a component of energy security in this aspect as well. In the European Commission, we calculated that for each percent energy saving in Europe, we can avoid to import 2.3% gas. That's sort of the calculus. So every time we save energy, we will have to send less money out of the European Union. We will have to support less uh, Putin and other regimes that we are not uh, too fond of. So that's really one thing also politics can do, get the pricing right. So we have the targets, we have the pricing, and what more can politics do? Well, politics can also set up standards and regulation. It's an extremely efficient tool. Building codes, 
standards for components, for machinery, for cars, for cooling systems, for aircon, for products, eco-design, we also call it. Again, that should be a no-brainer. If we have the technology, we know what to do, why not use the standards to pull the bulk of the market? It's a very, very efficient tool because by that, you force the market to innovate, you speed up innovation, and you help the best and the most innovative ones to pull sort of the others. You lift the bottom, so to speak. But some in industry would sometimes have a tendency to say, yes, but that is red tape. And to, to those who have not met red tape yet, that sort of bureaucracy. Oh, it's difficult when somebody in Brussels or elsewhere is setting up standards and regulations. Well, is it? Is it not easier to have one standard instead of 28 national standards? I think for those producing the products, it's, absolutely, uh, it's uh, actually easier to, to work with. But there is a dilemma here, and that's a political one. Because, for instance, in Europe, some of the things that is often being used in media most against Europe and Brussels regulating too much, that is actually often things coming from the energy efficiency side. Why are they putting standby clauses on uh, our coffee machines? or our vacuum cleaners, uh, why should Brussels decide that? So my plea to people from business is also, business sometimes ha has to be better at helping, getting the point through, that to put up standards and regulations, that is not against the interest of business, that is very much in the interest of business. Uh, I think the politicians need some help there. And then I would also mention another area where politics could make a difference, and that is public procurement. Uh, a much more consistent public procurement uh, policy where when the state or the region or the municipality use their big power as shopper or as buying things and good, if we agree that we want to go into a society that is much more energy efficient, much more resource efficient, then it should also be reflected when the public sector spends the money of all of us. So, much more consistent way of using the public sector's power when it comes to public procurement that can help, that can help create the, the demand and again, it can speed up innovation. And then, there is finally the, the labeling thing. I think a lot of citizens they want to pick the more energy efficient or resource efficient product. That is, if it is easy to find out what the most energy efficient and resource efficient product is. Uh, so labeling is extremely important and simple labeling. So that I do not have in the supermarket or in, when I'm buying a new washing machine or whatever, that's it's a whole study that takes, I do not know how long time to find out what is the reasonable and best environment choice here. But by mentioning labeling here towards the end, I'm also, and that is very much on purpose, ending not only with the politicians and what they should be doing, but with the citizens, with the consumers, with all of us. You know, I do not want us to handle climate change and the environmental challenges that the planet Earth is faced with only through top-down politics. Governments, UN telling everybody what to do or, or not, not to do. We can come a long way with targets, with pricing, with the right standards and regulations, but in the end, in free societies and in democratic societies, there's still a very big responsibility relying with each of us because our individual behavior means a lot. So I think labeling can help us. It can make it, it must be simple to do the right thing. It must be visible. And if we are doing the right stuff, choosing the right goods and products and the better ones for the environment, we should not be treated as economic idiots. So there also has to be sort of a, an economic in, incentive to, to make the right choices. But in the end, each of us have power.
part of the responsibility. I do not know how you see this. I feel that there is an undercurrent, a new paradigm is, is coming. Something is happening in the way we are thinking about these things. I think that we are moving away from this consumption culture where we buy things, consume things, and throw them out. I mean, even the Pope is now start, starting to talk about more sustainable consumption. Who would now have thought it came from there? But it's a natural place that it would come from somebody who actually is used to talk about more moral values and how each of us sort of should behave. That's something politicians, also for many good reasons, normally are very, very shy to talk about what people should be doing and to say anything about people's behavior. But nonetheless, I think that if we end up having a society here where everything comes from the politicians to tell us what to do, that would end up being a society that not many of us would like to live in. So I think that there, to move towards a society where we more reuse things, recycle things, materials, goods, where it is a virtue to save things, save energy, save resources, not to waste them. That is uh, something that I feel is, is coming and it's growing. And I think that that is also a component that we very much need. Take food waste. Around 40% of all the food produced in Europe is being wasted. It, there's no, never nobody who, who eats it. 40%, between 35 and 40%. That's a lot. But we have also seen examples that if you really put some words on this and focus on it and have the dialogue with supermarkets and the business and the distribution chain, then you can actually change it. So after having discussed this in Denmark for four or five years now, then food waste has gone down with 25%. That's actually a, a very, very fine example. I think that we are moving more into a circular economy where it's not use and throw out, but where it's reuse, reuse, reuse. Things are being constructed so that the components and the material can be reused. I think that it's a new set of values, uh, and I also think we should see this reflected in the whole sharing economy that we have only seen the start of, but I think it's coming more and more that younger generations do not have to own everything themselves, they can share it. And it's a fundamental challenge to the traditional way we have seen our economy and the growth. And uh, I would say to those of you representing the university and academia, I think this is also one area where the politicians really need input from academia, how this is challenging our normal sort of notion of growth. I think that Climate change should not be about, you must not do that. You should stop doing that. It should not be this negative vision. Uh, it should not be gloom and doom. I really think that we can make a positive vision to have energy efficient solutions. That's not dull, that's not boring, that's actually quite interesting. And a lot of co-benefits can come with it if we do it in the right manner. So uh, I think that paradoxically, when you have a scarcity of something, where there are limitations, then it often stimulates creativity, new ideas, more interesting solutions. And that is actually what we can do through energy efficiency. There are really many things in global climate politics, in European climate politics, in Danish climate politics, that are quite challenging and quite difficult. Energy efficiency should not be that difficult. Actually, uh, in my view, energy efficiency should be a no-brainer. In a world with climate change challenges and more and more people wanting a share in the good life, energy efficiency should be a no-brainer to business, to politicians, but also to us as citizens, because in the end, our politicians are not giving priority to these things unless they feel that there is somebody out there in the electorate 
who really thinks this is important. And uh, I think that most of you can figure out what it means if the acceleration of this movie, if that continues, if we don't do anything to stop it down, then I know who here will have a very, very big challenge in the future. And that will be the next generation and the next generation to come after them. So it's high time to start acting on the grand scale. And as we have said in European Commission, where I used to work, energy efficiency should be the first fuel. Because all other solutions, they are doable, but they are also costly and they are complex. But energy efficiency, to use our energy resources much more efficient, as I said, that must be a no-brainer. Thank you very much.